Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to just here's here's what we did last time. So we did this heat curl. The heat kernel that we we looked at just as a coincidence limit, which in general is x e to the minus tau times some differential operator x, and this guy generally has fields in it. And we wrote this as i over four pi to the d over two. E to the minus tau m squared. So we did it with a mass there. Tau d over 2. A0 plus A1 of x. Tau A2 of x. Tau squared plus dot, dot, dot. So this expansion. And the, the big use of this is almost always that A2 coefficient. So the A2 coefficient, so for example, the part of the Lagrangian that's divergent is minus i over 4 pi to the d over 2, gamma of 2 minus d over 2. There's an m to the d minus 4, m, yeah, m to the d minus 4, and a2 of x. I guess I need my integral d4x. There's this a2 coefficient is, is the is the b, and we use this in gravity to do the to reinterpret the loops, which was this plus this. This plus dot dot dot. We basically then got a divergent Lagrangian from scalar loops, which is one over sixteen pi squared, one over one eighty, one over epsilon, and then R mu nu alpha beta, R mu nu alpha beta, mi minus R mu nu. R mu nu, and for minimally coupled, it was five have R squared. Okay, so that's that's sort of where we, what we did last time was those sets of things. Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, was that already in there? The it's a good so the the question was can we do higher loop stuff with the heat kernel? And I think I think in principle it's in there, uh, but I I don't know how to pull it out. Um, I've, never done it. I've never done it either. Yeah, I've never done it. Um, I've only done one two, two looper in my life, and that the answer was a simple zero. <laughs> so I didn't have to, to do too much. Um, I think the 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 answer is that there is it is somewhat limited what you get. Actually, let me let me do this next segment, and then let's see if it if it helps I, the it looks almost like this um, heat journal is a panacea for all of our calculations it looks looks too simple and so here I want to do some limitations on this so let's do compare and contrast okay when I did this we're trying to make sense of um, we have d to o, so we in path integrals you get that e to the trace log o. That's that's what we're trying to make sense of when o contains fields. 
and so what I was trying to do is, is I was making connection. To perturbation theory, okay. and where, where, you know, I did this with photons. At first, this photon loop—that's my great example. Where we know how to do that, and we know the both the pains and 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 the subtleties of it. So first I did this perturbative expansion. You know, I took um, O is d mu d mu plus. In this case, I did a massless one. It's really just for simplicity. We could we could do other things. D mu uh, d mu was d mu plus gamma mu. And we we saw that two things. We saw um, so we had delta s, which was an integral d four x, some divergent piece, which we pulled out in terms of gamma and sigma. And then we had a finite piece, which was one over 16 pi squared integral d4x d4y it was 1 12th gamma mu nu of x l of x minus y gamma mu nu of y. And it was 1 half sigma of x this function L of X minus Y, sigma of Y. This was the Fourier tra transform of log Q squared. And let's see, what else do I have to say? The gamma mu nu was d mu d nu. And the divergent piece here was was one over sixteen pi squared, one over epsilon bar plus something epsilon epsilon bars is my notation for two over four minus d plus or minus log four pi plus or minus gamma. I've just forget my signs there. And then we had one twelfth the d mu d nu d mu d nu plus one half sigma squared. Where this is this is local, it's at the point X. Okay, so in this guy, we got um, both the divergent piece and we got these log pieces. The log pieces came out there. And just to think about the contrast here, if we had used M, of masses, then this function log of of x minus y might have gone into something that looks like box times delta of x minus y box over m squared with some number plus higher order things. So basically, there's some function of q squared. When you do this, that turns into a function of of derivative operators. Okay. Okay. So that was one technique. We got the divergence and we got the the background, and we got the finite pieces. In let's take a look at what we did. Heat kernel. 
the Hikono, we did something similar. We, we got the divergent piece, called divergent, proportional to A2, which was 1 12th d mu d nu d mu d nu plus 1 half sigma squared. So those two parts agree, that's great. The, the, the general result was we had delta S, you know, one over 16 pi squared. Let's just do the sum here. M to the D minus 2N <coughs> gamma of N minus D over two, integral D four X A N of X. So, there's, we've, we don't see the logs. Okay. We do see the higher order pieces in M squared. If you keep going up the higher ends, for example, A3 will have this form be, it'll be some number over M squared. And this will be then local. So it'd be like up here where the log piece went into this box over M squared piece. Um, A3 would actually look like that. So let's, let's actually need to put uh, sort of gamma gamma on the outside there. Um, so, so these these local pieces come at higher order. So what's what's the, the good features? Well, the good feature is that there's a big mathematical literature here. And so there's, there's a lot of results that you can get. The downside is it's local. Okay, we, the only way to make sense of this, or the way we made sense of it, was to keep the mass as a parameter. And so this becomes an expansion in one over M squared. And so it's hard to go to the M goes to zero limit. There is a non-local stuff. The, it, the person's name, if you want to track it down, is Vilkovsky. This key. Um, but it's it's unbelievably complicated. It's actually not that bad if all you're doing is this bubble diagram. You can get you can get back to the perturbative result here with these this bubble diagram with the log. If if all you're after is that log, you can get that easily out of Vilkovsky. Um but you can get it this way anyhow. You, um, so if you, in many in most cases, if you want to get the non-local pieces or the, the things that give you unitarity corrections and the like, you need to do the perturbative treatment or something like it. Um, but the downside of the perturbative treatment Actually, let's let's see if I can squeeze it here. Just save a page. Um, it 
The downside of the perturbative treatment is that the in gravity, these long distance stuff, these this logs and the like, are very ill defined. And I'll explain that. That's my actually my next topic a little bit is propagators. in GR are tough. So those long distance stuff that you get in flat space pretty easily by just using usual propagators is very hard to pull them out. You can get local stuff real easy and the heat kernel is great for that. Long distance stuff is tough. And so let me, let me turn to propagators if I'm okay. Okay. They actually are another um, use of heat kernel techniques. And I will, so that's what I want to just put it here for. So here's another use is propagated. But is there any questions about sort of this general compare and contrast here? The, the two techniques give the same divergences. The, the perturbative gives the finite piece, but is not so easy to do in general relativity. The, in general relativity, the local stuff comes out much better using heat kernel. And it's mainly because the mathematicians have done all the work. Um, so I'm the the non this Vilkovsky non local stuff is starting to be well it's been used by physicists but not applied to the real world very much so I, it's one of the things I'm trying to fight my way into right now so I'm trying to do this effect my next paper will be on trying to make sense of this basis. Okay, so let's do just talk about propagators for a minute. The to do a propagator you need to to describe two point functions in a background. Yeah, g mu nu of x. So you might take zero time order product phi of x, phi of y, zero. And um, try to compute that. There's, there's a couple of things that, that go wrong. One is, is the background. Um, it's then, you would think that it's a well-posed math problem. But it's, there is no real solution. No generic solution that's useful. The other, the other thing that's not so clear about is when you have in time dependent situations, what is the vacuum? Okay. So th that's also a problem. And we're going to come back and we can be doing this when we do Hawking radiation. Because in fact, Hawking radiation is basically the the mismatch of vacuum something that looks like a vacuum in at one time at later times doesn't look like a vacuum state anymore therefore we describe it by a radiating state so we have these these two problems one is sort of a math problem of of trying to solve things and the other is a physics problem 
the math problem has a, has a couple solutions, uh, partial solutions. So there's there's one there's there's a few things that can be said in special cases. Even here, though, the the functional forms are very complicated, and I'm not going to. I don't think I'm going to show any of them. Um, the second thing is that as x goes to y, the heat kernel works again. Okay, so there's a heat kernel expansion or an asymptotic expansion of propagators near the coordinates in its limit. That's, that's actually quite useful. And then there's again perturbation theory that works. Okay, at least the leading order. I'm going to show you these two before moving on out of this unit. Um, so let's let's just start with the heat kernel one. Uh, let's. I'll set up the problem. I'm not going to work out all the steps, but from what you've seen, you you should be able to see that it could be worked out. Where are we? There we go. Um, so the Lagrangian is written as integral d for x. I'll, put, I, I'll do the integration by parts trick <coughs> phi o phi where this o is d mu square root of minus g g mu nu d nu plus m squared okay the equations of motion are box plus m squared actually actually I missed something here there's a square root of g there's g there also box plus m squared phi equals zero, which is this one over square root of minus g times this O. Okay. So if we're looking for a Green's function, we would take this one over the square root of minus g O some d f, so this is O of x, x minus y, equals minus 1 over square root of minus g, delta 4 of x minus y, so that, that we have this, if you have some source, phi of x would be, um, minus integral d4y square root of minus g df of x minus y, whatever your source is of j of y. Then you get, then you get box plus m squared phi equals j of x. Okay, so if you wanted to solve that equation, you'd use this and the only little trick is, is following the factors of root g, okay, which I think I did right, hopefully, okay. But then here's then here's how we could solve this. 
the heat kernel implies that, um, so here D of X minus Y is X O minus Y. This guy's a pretty abstract operator at this stage because O is a function of, of the metric and the metric here is, is it at X, is it at Y? It's, this, is, this is not awesomely well specified. It's a, that's a very complicated beastie. But we can put it in terms of the heat kernel as e to the, my, the integral d tau, zero to infinity of x e to the minus tau o y, which is then our heat kernel. So this is integral z zero to infinity d tau. Our heat kernel of x and tau, I'm sorry, x, y, and tau. Okay, this is the off-diagonal one. So this is still not solvable. Uh, we still don't have a good technique to put that into a closed form expression. But, but if you're close to X, so as X goes to Y, we can do this. Okay. And the, the trick, the easiest, the best trick is this, again, this Riemann normal coordinates Riemann normal coordinates where you write g mu nu is eta mu nu minus a third r mu alpha nu beta y alpha y beta where this is the deviation. This is uh, x prime minus x. The deviation, and then you can write out the the you write out box plus m squared, so the full covariant box plus m squared on some Green's function on df. Equals well, it's it's box zero plus m squared plus terms involving the curvature, et cetera, on DF. Okay, and so basically you do this expansion here um, and here's what it ends up looking like. Right? So I'm not actually gonna pull off, but the, the answer is illuminating um, the Parker did it first um, the place to do it is um, is Burrell and Davies book or Parker and Tom's book Neither of these do it in great detail, but you can see a few more steps. So this this is Parker and Tom's that are in, in the reference list. So if you want to see it, but here's what it looks like. Here's the it's the asymptotic expansion, df of x x prime looks like as x is getting close to x prime. You write out a Fourier, Fourier expansion 
at the point x prime, e to the minus i k dot x minus x prime. And then it's a zero of x x prime plus a one of x x prime minus d by dm squared. Now, this is going to act on something, just a minute. Um, plus a2 of x, x prime minus d by dm squared squared plus dot 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 on 1 over k squared minus m squared. Okay. So it's not so different from what we did before, the, except that we have this, um, these are still functions of x and x prime, but a zero is still one, a one of x, x prime, x, let me just do a two, a two of x, x prime, is just our a2 of x at this order. In other words, you don't have to, consistently, you don't have to go any higher or x dependence on this one. This one is, the a1 does have the, the piece that was before, the local piece, c minus a 6, R. And then it has terms that look like minus a 12 R comma alpha Y alpha and minus a six, some A alpha beta, Y alpha Y beta. So to consistently go to this next order, you need to keep these co coefficient terms and A alpha beta is, is written out in these books. A alpha beta, for example, A alpha beta looks like, um, I'll just pick out a random piece, 1 60th, 1 over 60 R, Kappa lambda alpha beta r kappa lambda. Bunch of terms like that. So it's we're if you want to work the second order in the curvature, you need to keep these these pieces and the A2s. Okay. So there's there's our there's your best look at what a propagator looks like. Is there a question in Dartmouth? No. Okay. So it's yeah, the, the retarded propagator. You would, if you wanted the retarded propagator, you just put just change your i epsilons right there. Okay. Um, yeah, the, 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 that's right. So you, you shift it from plus I epsilon into the K zero plus minus I epsilon piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean there, um, but you may mean what I'm about to do, which is the perturbative expansion. We'll we'll see about this one. Let's let me do the perturbative expansion. See if that's what you what you did. It's sort of a 
it's an iteration of the the propagators. If neither of these is it, um, what you're doing, I'd be interested in have, have you shown me what it is just so, so I know. Because all these techniques are useful just to keep in the back of your head. Okay, so if we're good with that, let's do perturbation theory, the perturbative expansion. Okay, the perturbative expansion. I'm going to do this only in harmonic gauge just because it makes it a little easier. The what we basically had was this um, the equation that we had was square root of g. Um, in harmonic gauge, the the derivatives work pass through the the g's, and so it's square root of g g mu nu d mu d nu plus m squared. So df of x minus y equals minus delta four of x minus y. Okay, so I've just Harmonic gauge if the the derivative on the square root of minus g g mu nu derivative is equal to the square root of minus g g mu nu two derivatives. Okay, that's this is this is harmonic gauge. Um, so at, at this stage, what we do is we take g mu nu upper is eta mu nu minus h mu nu, and the square root of g is square root of minus g is equal to one plus a half h lambda lambda. So we had gotten those guys out before in, in our weak field limit. So this implies that this is box zero, which is, means flat space box. And then if you just let me collect all the pieces. Um, I, I collected as minus h mu nu, d mu d nu, Minus a half eta mu nu box zero plus m squared plus m squared df of x minus y minus delta four of x minus y. Okay. Um, you can sort of see the pieces. The there's this from the the square root of g. There's box plus m squared with an eta mu nu, so the trace of that, and then the g mu nu piece with the d mu d mu d nu piece. Okay. Let me just call this guy tau mu nu. as an operator, just so I can follow it around. So we, we end up with box zero plus m squared minus h mu nu tau mu nu df x minus y is minus delta four of x minus y. Okay. Um, So we can solve this perturbatively. Let's define, um, let me use delta zero of x minus y such that um, box zero plus m squared 
delta zero is the Green's function. So that's the usual flat space Feynman Green's function. Okay. Then, then df of x minus y is delta zero of x minus y plus delta one of x minus y, where this is going to be of order h. Okay, so we have box zero plus m squared minus h mu nu tau mu nu on delta zero plus delta one equals minus delta four of x minus y. But delta box zero plus times delta zero gives me that delta four. And H times delta one is second order. So this gives me then box zero, the order H pieces, box zero plus M squared delta one of x minus y minus h mu nu tau mu nu delta zero of x minus y equals zero. Okay, well this 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 is then pretty easy to iterate. This is just like a usual Green's function equation. You put put your source over on the left hand side, box zero on the Green's function equals a source. So let's let's just do it. Uh, I'll just write out the solution. You can see it pretty easily. Delta one of x minus y is then uh, up to the only thing to do is get the sign right. Um, minus integral d4z delta zero of x minus z h mu nu z tau z mu nu delta zero of z minus y Okay, so let's just check it. Here's the, let's check if we do box zero plus m squared on delta one. This first term turns into, so I have the integral d four z. I get minus delta of four of x minus z, z h mu nu tau mu nu delta zero of z, of, um, z minus y. But that delta function then gives me back just x. And so I get then h mu nu, let's see, I, get my, I, I had a minus out in front, I get plus, yes, I'm getting my signs right, h mu nu of x tau x mu nu delta zero of x minus y. Okay, so I got what I needed to get. So this this is something that I end up, I, I'm not sure if this is the official name for it, but it, it's an iterative solution, multiple reflection expansion I've seen that used in, in similar cases, but basically if we have X, point X, point Y, and we want 
the full propagator going between there, you take the first order is just the the bare propagator. Then the sex of the next order is you propagate out x. This is x y x z y. And then the next order would be you propagate out hit two of these guys x z z prime y plus dot dot dot. You propagate so the the first order propagator again is second order in the in the the lowest order propagator the free propagator. Okay, fair enough. So those those are the two ex useful ex propagator approximations that I know of, either the heat kernel or this perturbative one. They must, if you have another one, I'd be interested. Does it look at all like what you're doing? No? All right. All right. Well, show me what was shown. So for Dartmouth folks, one of the guys here has some other way he's been doing it. Okay. All right, so my that's actually where I'm going to end the heat kernel stuff. So end of heat kernel. The last thing I need to do is we need to move into ghosts. Ghost. Okay. Any questions before moving on? All right. So let's just okay. So a couple of things to say about ghosts just to set the stage. There's actually in field theory there's two uses of meanings of ghosts. They're somewhat related, but one's good and one's bad. Okay. The the good one is, is what we're going to do here. We're we're of course not going to do the bad one. This the good one is that it's the Fidei of Popov ghosts for quantizing gauge series and gravity. Yang Mills and gravity. It's the only only good way to do either of those. The bad one is negative dorm states. Okay. The negative norm state. So for example, if I had a Lagrangian where I had in my usual basis minus d mu phi minus d mu phi. Um, and that, if you work it out, has the Hamiltonian, which goes like minus, minus d0 phi squared, for example, with a minus sign there. So it's, it's unbounded below and things are bad. The way you look for these guys is you look in propagators and you get the wrong sign in the propagators. Of course, you have to be very careful that you know what your, your sign conventions are when you're doing this, but, um, but basically you're looking for states that are unstable. They run away, run away solutions. And they often happen in, in fourth order theories. So second order theories, you can sort of fix it by hand. Fourth order theories, could have problems. 
Okay. Now, if, but the, the good ghosts, they actually, the, the, the history here is actually sort of interesting. I mean, most of the textbook treatments today, of course, everyone does Yang Mills and you, you do these things for Yang Mills. They were actually found first in gravity. And so the, the story goes, I haven't, I've only read the story. I've not read the paper, but it, the, these were discovered by Feynman. And it was a sort of a typical Feynman idea. He was trying to quantize gravity and he did the following. It tells you what, what they're good for. The, the story is actually the, the story of what they're good for. If you were trying to do the vacuum polarization diagram. Well, Feynman knows that this has certain analytic properties. And so you can actually reconstruct the, the, the vacuum polarization from the cut. Okay, so the, the analytic properties of Feynman diagrams are such that their real parts are related to their imaginary parts. And their imaginary parts correspond to real on shell particles. Okay. For for gravity, we know this is this is helicity plus and minus two. Okay. So you can do this um calculate that cut explicitly from just knowing the triple graviton vertices. Painful, but apparently that's what he did. But then he says or you could try using a propagator. Let's let's imagine I did that harmonic gauge propagator. I gave you the harmonic gauge. So some covariant propagator. Okay, so the harmonic gauge when you know so it was some tensor structure up here, one over q squared, you know, be eta mu nu, eta alpha beta, blah 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 blah, blah stuff like that. Now that has more components than the than just the helicity plus and minus two. The, um, and so he didn't get the same answer. He, 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 he gets the wrong answer. There's basically too many components. Oh. But then he notes that he, he can get the right answer by subtracting out something. Subtracting out the unphysical components. And he can do that by just by making a, a fictitious particle and a minus sign. Okay, so he, he puts these, these fictitious particles in there, runs them through the loop. And so basically what he ends up proving is that the, 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 the amplitude re from the cut is the amplitude with covariant gravitons Minus, let's I'll draw the solid lines. So 
something which has come to be called ghosts. Okay. So, this, so apparently he did this at a, some conference in, in Poland. Bryce DeWitt was in the, the audience. DeWitt went back and did this better. in the path integral. More or less the way that we're going to end up doing it. Um, so instead of just doing it by hand, he goes back and says, well, here's how to do it rigorously from the start. At this stage, Fideyev and Pop Fideyev in particular, and Popov, we're interested in Yang Mills, and they did it for Yang Mills. Because there is a similar issue there. And as best I know, it was Ben Lee who, who named the ghosts after Fideyev and Popov because he was interested in doing Yang Mills theory, which was much more in play at the time. So this is all 60s. Mid 60s, early 60s. And so they've become Fidea Pop of Ghosts, but they really should be Simon DeWitt Ghosts. Okay, so yeah. But anyhow, but this tells you the role. So basically, the role is to fix the gauge and subtract out on physical degrees of freedom. So most covariant gauges need ghosts, but not all. They have nothing to do with negative normal states. I think the only thing that you you can say that looks like the negative norm states is I do stick this minus sign here, okay? And the minus sign will be accommodated when we do ghosts by having the ghosts be fermions, even though the gauge bosons are not fermions. And then we close loops with fermions, the Feynman rule has a minus sign. So you, the fact that you're subtracting them off is is the only connection that I know to the other one, but you have to watch out because you know the, sometimes people you'll be reading a paper and they'll say, "Oh, there's no ghost in this theory." And you're like, oh, that's, that's is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know. Um, but then also, not all gauges require ghosts. There, if we get here, I don't. Uh, we'll see how where we get. It's not today, but at the end of the semester, I was thinking of doing this this helicity, thinner helicity formalism. If we get there, this thinner helicity formalism is a very, so doesn't have ghosts. And it's basically a variation of axial gauges, which if I get there, I'll explain. <laughs> axial gauges don't have ghosts. Okay, but we'll go through gauges that do for the moment. Um, well, you know, actually what we're going to do, what you're going to see in gravity um, is there's going to be four fermionic ghosts. So they'll carry a Lorentz index and they'll be fermionic. In Yang Mills, they're just fermionic, just one fermion. And so sort of like, you know, there's an extra Lorentz index when you go from Yang Mills to gravity, that Lorentz index carries on along the ghost. It's an extra uh, extra four gauge fixing piece. 
Okay. Good. So. Okay. So let's just let's, let's just start off um, with the diagnosis of what's going on here. So here's here's what what goes wrong. Okay. When we're doing a path integral, let's let's imagine doing perturbation theory. We write d phi e to the i integral d four x. So it's it's phi some operator phi plus j phi. And we do that path integral, we get one over the determinant of the operator, e to the minus j o j o inverse. Okay, that's this is the integral d four x d four y. J propagator J X X to Y. Okay. So this is our standard way of starting out perturbation theory in 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 um, in path integrals. But if we are doing gauge theories, we start off with e to the i integral d4x. Well, it's a mu, so there's some differential operator d mu, o mu nu, let's call it a nu. This, this comes from the minus a quarter f mu nu, f mu nu by integrating by parts plus j mu a mu, but I think, but as I explained once before, O mu nu does not have an inverse. Um, I, I have the demonstration here, but let's, again, let's skip it, okay? So, but because I'm mainly interested in the logic here. So there is no inverse of this. And so therefore you can't do, there, there seems to be problems with the path integral. But the diagnosis is, is, is not that hard to do. The diagnosis is basically that we, we know that if you fix the gauge, then it's easy to do the inverse. So that tells you that the problem is there's too many copies of, of of a gauge copies. So when we're instructed to integrate over all A, we're integrating over gazillion A's because they're all re related by gauge invariance. And so if the trouble is created by too many gauge copies, we want to to restrict the integral To at least a subset. Okay, so, so the trick is how do you 
how do you restrict this integral, path integral, to a subset consistently? Okay. So here's the here's the the, the technique in a simpler context. So let's imagine that you had some, this is just some simple integral. So let's have an integral. Integral is dx dy e to the i s of x y. Okay, that sort of looks like what we're doing. But let's imagine that that, was spherically, that function was spherically symmetric s of x and y equaling just s of the magnitude of, of the r. So it's, it's spherically symmetric so of course we know that the way you would do this then is you just make that s of r, you change variables to r and theta, you do the theta integral and then the r integral is the only one that's interesting. So you want to factor out the theta integral. So okay, so here's a fancy way of doing it. You write one is the actually it's I'm gonna I'm sorry, it's the phi integral. Okay, I'm doing two dimensions, so we've got r x y is r and phi. Okay, is, is the the variables. But I mean, insert one as in the following form: is d theta times the delta function of theta minus phi. Okay, then then W is integral R D R D phi integral D theta delta of theta minus phi e to the i s of R. Okay, this is overkill, but let's just do it. Then the phi integration can be done. So then you do phi, do the phi integration. And then the, um, this is then, the integral d theta of some w of theta, where w of theta is integral um, d, well, it's just d two r um, delta of theta minus phi e to the i s of r, but that's independent of theta. And so this is just, this turns into two pi. And I've got my, I've got a constrained integral now left over. So w, w is two pi w of theta, which is two pi integral d 2r delta of theta minus phi e to the i s of r. Hey, what? Where did the... I'm sorry, was there a question there? Yeah, what yeah. in the phi integral, doesn't that eat up the delta function? Yeah, actually, I put it back in. I'm sorry. Let, let, let me just go back and, and say this again. 
what I basically am trying to do is I, I'm trying to go back and just leave this integral unchanged, but have a delta function inside. Okay. Okay. So I've, by doing this, putting this in here, pulling the d theta out, I've got a w of theta with a constraint inside of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me just, if, if, if I may, I'll, I'll try to review this again, but just to make the point where we're going here. Um, if I had a more complicated constraint, uh, it's, I'm ending in an awkward time. So instead of having just this, um, I might try something like delta of some G of R equals zero. Then what I've been inserting is integral d theta, um, d g d theta, delta of g of r equals one. Okay, this this is the the variables that you have. Um, when you have a delta function of a function, you have to, you have this d theta dg or dg d theta as the Jacobian there. So this is the unit thing. And since I'm running over already, I'm gonna come back and um, say this again, but basically here's where we're headed. This is going to be this is going to turn in when we do gauge series into the gauge theory constraint. So whatever we want constraint we want to impose, we put that delta function there. That that's the constraint. This is going to turn into a, a Jacobian, and that Jacobian is going to turn into the ghost. Okay, so when I come back, I'm gonna start out trying to do the same thing that I did up here, factoring out that, but with a more complicated constraint. And we're gonna have this Jacobian and that Jacobian after turning the crank a bit with field theory is gonna turn into ghosts. Okay, good.